Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1972 Italian giallo film, Eye in the Labyrinth. And I'm going to be honest with you right up front, this has cracked my top 10 after I watched it. Now, I'm not going to say that from, you know, a visual standpoint, it's the most amazing, like some sort of Argento or Bava type thing. But uh, when you put together how it looks, how it's acted, all the technical stuff, but mainly the story and all the craziness that's injected into this film, it has cracked my top 10. Uh, oh, man. Uh, really like this one. Gotta see it. So anyway, gonna talk about it. Directed by Mario Cayano. Cayano? Uh, best guess there. He also directed films such as Nightmare Castle, The Sexberry Tales, and Nazi Love Camp 27. Just more of the interesting uh, titles that he's directed. Also written by Cayano and Antonio Segura. And Segura wrote some scripts for films such as Ten Days That Shook the World. That was it. And then uh, Horst Hockler, who wrote the script for Let It All Hang Out. Just letting you know. So the film was co-produced with a German company and stars several popular German actors, actually. But apparently it wasn't. It didn't get a, an actual like formal release within Germany. So that's kind of weird to kind of have that German connection and that much... Uh, involvement German wise and not really be released there it was mainly just an Italian release the opening shot of a shadow running away from the camera and to the side is super interesting it really does create this kind of surreal perspective with the way that the camera set up and the way the shadow runs away it's kind of it's very surreal it's very odd and it's just this kind of like uh, spiraling type thing which I think is supposed to kind of mirror the title of the film, Eye in the Labyrinth, which is talking about that painting, which obviously in the very end of the film is what is housing Lucas's head, severed head. And I'll get to the severed head scene at the end, but geez, I have a lot to say about that. But I really do view that that initial thing. It's supposed to make it seem surreal like that painting. It's supposed to make it feel a little bit dizzying and kind of circular-like as Lucas is running away from his killer. And... That, I think, is supposed to be kind of a visual tie-in to that painting that you see at the end, which is the eye in the labyrinth, because it has that kind of eye in the middle of the labyrinth picture. Um, so I love the fact that there, that's that tie-in to the actual title, because there are plenty of times where Giallo films have very interesting titles. They almost always do, but they don't really tie into the film. It's more of like a, this catches your ear, so let's just use it. So I like that it actually tied in. Uh, solidly brutal stabbing to start the film. And that's one of the things that I like about this film is that the kills feel brutal, look brutal, are pulled off pretty well, have a decent amount of gore to them, and the acting involved with it of who's receiving the kill, pretty well done too. So they really feel intense, they feel brutal. And from the get-go with Lucas's death, that's what you get. So you really know what you're getting into, well, what you're in store for in a very delightful way. The first big mystery, what is Maracudi? I like that they kind of start with that kind of vague uh, vague mentioning of Maracudi, and then you find Maracudi written down in one of Lucas's books, and then that kind of starts you down this road of really piquing your interest and thinking, oh, we're solving a mystery here, here starts the investigation. And obviously then, you know, Julie takes off and starts doing her investigating. Uh, you gotta love the gas pump attendant that she uh, encounters who's just blatantly reading porn magazine. Uh, and then he also, like, has a line where he's trying to, like, come on to Julie while she's getting her gas pump. Uh, just kind of funny. It, this just goes back to the whole quirky things that Giallo films throw in. I enjoy it, though. I like those weird, odd, quirky characters that, that pop up constantly in Giallo films. And this gas station attendant, obviously one of them. So usually it's a guy who starts the investigating in the, in these films, so it's a very nice change to have Julie in that role for, for a change. Um, I really do enjoy the fact that it, it's Julie because, like I said, the majority of the time in these Giallo films, it's some guy investigating something. So it's just an interesting change of pace to have it be a woman instead. And if you've watched as much Giallo as I have, and I'm watching Giallo every single week, uh, usually about two Giallo films a week-ish, um... You, you get into that mode of just like being in the groove of, okay, this is how it is, this is how all these films are. So then when one of them does something very different or that seems different enough, 
you're just like, oh, this is interesting. This sticks out in a way. So having Julie being the main investigator really stuck out. It was interesting. I like how Julie is pointed to uh, is pointed to an abandoned building, and she wants to know who to ask for when she gets into the building, and the response from the guy who's pointing it out to her says, it doesn't matter. Then she almost falls out a door to nowhere, and someone tries to kill her with rubble that they knock loose. So um, I think her first indicator should have been the fact that the person was like, yeah, it doesn't really matter, because obviously he thought it didn't really matter, because he was going to try and have her killed, or he was supposed to try to have her killed. So, yeah, uh, I do like that scene, though. I think it sets up more of the mystery. It makes it more intense. It shows you that there are real stakes at play here. It's not just Julie going through an investigation that'll be seamlessly easy for her. There's danger involved, and there's someone potentially, either at least one person potentially coming after her, maybe more. So I like that danger that's introduced in that way. Why is Julie skinny dipping when she needs to be looking for Lucas? This was one of the things that really hit me as odd, but once again, Giallo, they do odd things, uh, where she just finds his beach, gets out of her car, and decides to just skinny dip for no reason. I, I thought she was kind of in a hurry to find Lucas. Now, obviously, it makes a lot more sense at the end of the film when we find out that she herself is the killer, uh, and that, you know, because of her psychosis, she's kind of, like, disassociated from the actual events of killing him, so she's not really aware of it. But at the same time, she's subconsciously aware of being the killer. So there are things that she acts on based off of the subconscious, and then there are things that she acts on based off of the conscious. So I would assume that her just stopping for a skinny dip is more based off her subconscious that's basically saying, we don't really need to hurry up here because we killed him and we know where his body is. So you can take some time, do some skinny dipping, let the local boys snicker and laugh and point at you at your hot nude body. That's what they do in Giallo. And there is a lot of nudity in the film, too. That's the other thing. I mean, obviously, that was one of the things about Giallo films. There was a big drawback in this time period because people weren't really seeing nudity all that much, especially not film-wise nudity. So injecting it into these films was a real selling point for people. Gerda's place is interesting, to say the least. Lots of eccentric characters hanging out there. Obviously, you end up finding out later that she's basically running drugs. She has a whole drug-pushing operation going on, and all those characters hanging out with her are kind of these, yeah, they're eccentric. They're kind of like artistic types who have just kind of been there because they want a free place to stay. They want to be involved with her drug running. They want to be involved in taking her drugs and just kind of living in her house. So it's this interesting kind of commune that's going on there. So I like that setting for the film too. It's a very cool aspect of it that I haven't seen in a film before. So, or at least not a giallo before. So I, I really like that incorporation. Frank is a creep and we find out how much of a, he, a creep he is gradually throughout the film. Uh, he acts like he's trying to help Julie out in the beginning out of the kindness of his heart, but he's really just trying to get in her pants. Really, that is his motivation throughout the whole thing. He's really just trying to get with Julie again, and obviously we see that in the end that he ends up being with her, uh, but I'll talk about that at the very end when chronologically it makes more sense. You can tell Sorrow, that was the boy who was a really good painter from the orphanage that was near Gerda's place, uh, you can tell Sorrow will end up being the key to solving Lucas's murder when they reveal his painting of a stabbing. Now, that's the fact that Sorrow was going to be the one to be the key to it, but obviously he ends up ending up dead, and then we have Frank, who just ends up explaining everything at the very end of the film. Which, the best part of the film, obviously, the reveal on that, I was like, my head was like spinning. I was like, what? This is crazy. Love it. Julie didn't learn her lesson from the abandoned building. Uh, this, I'm referencing the car garage situation where someone says, oh, you should stop by the garage. I think, was that Thomas, maybe? It was either Thomas or the other guy. I know his name's in here somewhere, but um, yeah, so she didn't learn her lesson of someone just telling her to go do something. Um, she really needs to just stop listening to random people because then she goes into the garage and then someone tries to kill her by locking her in the garage and having the car running. She just doesn't, she doesn't do a good job of learning lessons in this film. 
Just saying. When Frank saved Julie from asphyxiation in that garage situation, I started to think he's putting her in danger to then show up and save her so he can work on getting in her pants. And basically, there, there kind of, you know, there was a degree of that going on, but there was also Gerda trying to basically get rid of Julie because um, she didn't want her snooping around with her whole operation there, and then also all of her minions who are living at her house also being a part of all of that. Um, and in the really creepy way when they start, like, coming at her as, like, this kind of mindless group towards the end of the film where Gerda's just, like, you know, get her, basically, and they're all, like, slowly creeping towards her, um, it seems like she firmly has control over all of them. Maybe it's the drugs. Gotta love Eugene's freakout scene. That one was funny. Eugene, the guy with the glasses, uh, who's living there at Gerda's house and had, you know, manipulated the audio, but he was like, I swear I didn't know what the audio manipulation was for. I was just told to do it by Gerda, and I did it. Uh, and then he has his flashback where he's talking about his argument that he ended up having with Lucas when Lucas was still alive, and just, like, hit the freak out that he has during that when he just, like, loses it because Lucas has touched a nerve about his stay in a mental ward. Um, just very funny the way it was acted. And that's the thing. Like, there are, there are a decent amount of unintentionally funny things in the film, which also add to the experience of it, for me personally. Every story that gets told about Lucas makes him sound pretty awful. Yeah, that's the big thing I was starting to wonder. I'm like, you think that usually the initial victim that people are trying to find out what happened to him and why in these films, you think that they're, they're usually a good person. It's usually someone who had a bad person come by him or they had some sort of motive to kill him, but they were a good person. But with all these flashbacks that we get about Lucas, like, none of them are good. None of them show him in, in a good light at all. I mean, what he, you know, the antagonizing of Eugene, he raped, what was the one girl's name? I forget her name, but she's barely, I mean, they've said her, they said her name like once or twice, but he raped her. Um, then there was another instance where another girl, he was trying to like, um, you know, sneakily watch her get naked. Like, just like a scumbag dude. And then you find out, you know, in the end, what kind of led to Julian ending up killing Lucas, which was that he basically was manipulating her the whole time for his, you know, personal enjoyment and um, just kind of like to unlock the mystery of her psychosis while having a relationship with her sexually and then figures it out in the end and it's just like, ah, you know, I feel like I'm done with you. So like, just a horrible person. So once you start seeing these kind of flashbacks, I started thinking, why is she so concerned about solving this? I mean, I know they were together, but like, this is a terrible guy. And how does she not notice that? So I guess she did. That was part of kind of her subconscious holding on to that, knowing that he was terrible. But her the, her conscious self <clears throat> is more idealistic, I guess. Great scene when Julie is getting shot at with a spear gun from the speeding boat. I thought that was really, really cool. That's something I've never seen in a film before. First of all, you don't see spear guns used in films that much anyway. But then to have the spear gun being shot from a speeding boat that's just like going around in the water, it was a cool scene. I enjoyed it. Something new. Real nice work, Julie. You killed sorrow, you idiot. That's what I put down. Uh, it's by far the best scene. that Yeah, it's by far my best scene where she accidentally kills sorrow. I just can't believe how that unfolded because it's so comical. But then later Frank reveals she subconsciously killed Sorrow on purpose. I think that part is a great twist. That's obviously where she's, you know, speeding in the car with Sorrow because she's like, we're going to go tell the authorities that you saw the killer and you saw the whole thing go down because you're painting. And then she starts having those like flashes of the eye in the labyrinth painting, which we find out about later. And, um... That's, I think, like her psychosis kicking in. That's her subconscious coming to the forefront that's saying, no, you don't want to take sorrow because he's going to reveal that you killed Lucas. So that's kind of her moment of understanding that. And that's why she ends up almost going off the cliff with the car. Obviously, then sorrow whacks his head on the uh, dashboard. He's in a bad state. He's bleeding all over. And then the funny part happens where she gets out of the car and she's like, I'm going to get you help. Gets out of the car. And I just love how it unfolds. She goes to the back of the car and she pulls out a cigarette. First of all, when that happens, I'm like, I thought she said she was going to go get help, but she's more concerned with having a cigarette right now. This doesn't match. 
Then she strikes the match. Like, she brings the match up like she's going to strike it. And then they pan down and show that it's the car is leaking gas right there. And when that happened, I was like, oh, no. No, no, no. they're not going to. Really? And then it goes back to her, and she strikes the match. She drops it after lighting the cigarette. And then flames just everywhere. The car starts burning. I start laughing because the way it unfolds is so comical. And she's like, oh, no, oh, no. And just at that time, it seemed like it was unintentional. Obviously, in the end, you find out that Frank's all like, no, that was intentional because subconsciously you knew that Sorrow knew that you were the killer and you never wanted him. Sub subconsciously, you never wanted him to get to the authorities. So subconsciously, you killed Sorrow. I love that twist to it. it was, I didn't see that twist coming. But at the time when I thought she was just that stupid and that clumsy, um, it was funny. Julie is so dense. <laughs> She just eats the sugar cube that Lewis gives her. She still hasn't learned to stop just doing whatever people say. That was another one of those instances where he's just like, here, eat this. She's like, what is it? He says it's sugar. And then she's just like, oh, okay, come on. Who just wants to eat a cube of sugar? That's the first thing. Second thing, you would follow up with a question of, why are you trying to just feed me a cube of sugar? What is special about this cube of sugar? LSD. That's obviously what was going on here. I'm assuming LSD, but I just thought that was kind of funny. It's like she won't learn. She just won't learn. Then we learn Lucas was a drug pusher. Why was Julie seriously with this dude? Just a reiteration of what I said before. Julie seems to get over Lucas pretty easily, though, once Lewis takes his pants off. Obviously, after eating the sugar, just eating the sugar... They get in bed, she seems totally fine. Now, obviously, that's that subconscious part of her, which I'm assuming they're kind of pointing at the drugs or unlocking her subconscious in that moment. So she's really able to kind of let loose, um, forget about Lucas for a bit, and just sleep with uh, sexy Lewis because that's what she actually wants. Subconsciously, she's done with Lucas. She knows he's dead. She's ready to move on. Lewis is right there. She'd like a piece, and she gets a piece. Gerda is cold-blooded. When she shoots Lewis in the back with a spear gun, I don't know why she did that, though, because she's like, no, don't. I assume it's just because she was angry that Lewis was pursuing uh, Julie because Lewis was supposed to be her plaything. Um, so I guess there was a jealousy thing why she shot him, but, I mean, she could have just caught up to him later. I don't think he was going to catch up to Julie and get in the car with her, really. Or maybe she was. I don't know. Maybe that's what she was concerned about. But it was cold-blooded regardless how she just shoots him in the back with that spear gun. And then he ends up dead, and they just throw his body out to sea. Cold. Man, what a reveal with Lucas's severed head behind the painting on the wall. I That hit me, like, out of left field. I was, I was shocked. I was stunned at that moment where she opens up that painting, and there's this cubby in the wall with his severed head. And it looked so disgusting. It looked so good. That's the other thing. The attention to detail and the practical effects on this for its time, for 1972, looked pretty great. So that was just a great shocking moment. And then after that, it's just this cavalcade of explanations of what was really going on. And the whole time, I'm just like, whoa. I was excited. So Julie killed Lucas because he was leaving her after she realized he had used her as an amusement to delve into her psychosis while having a relationship with her because he was a psychiatrist. A psy yeah, I think a psychiatrist. So th it was just like his have a fun time with it. And she's a good looking lady. So while I'm having a fun time picking her brain apart, why don't I sleep with her? Oh, now I've uh, done with that. So throw her aside. But no, Julie won't let it. Her psychosis, more importantly, won't let it. So ee, ee, ee. then throwing Gerda's drug running into the mix just makes the story even better, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, it just ups the ante of craziness. There's more going on. It's more interesting. It's more intriguing. Love the intricacies of the script to this. Holy crap, the head sawing scene is grisly. This is what I was talking about before with the brutality that goes on in this film. And the sound that they use when she's sawing his head off with the knife, really gross. Cr it made me cringe because, like, it sounded... Uh, something akin to what that would sound like. It makes it more gross. It makes it more shocking. It makes it more brutal. And that scene is wonderful. That might be my second favorite. Well, 
The head reveal is probably my second favorite. Then the head song is probably my third favorite scene. Plenty of favorites for this. And after the big reveal, Frank takes Lucas's place as Julie's everything. And of course, he ends up dying in turn because of that. Because obviously you find out what Frank's motive was in the end. He knew the whole story. He knew everything that had gone on. His aim the whole time was to take the steps to get back to Lucas's place. Because Julie talks about even how Lucas had become her everything. You know, he was her lover. He was her father. He was her caretaker. He was all these things. And that's what Frank wanted. So he gets there in the very end of the film. But what he didn't think about is, if I'm going to be like Lucas, I might end up meeting the same end as Lucas. And that's obviously how the film ends, with a savage stabbing that uh, Julie delivers to Frank. And as the audience member, we're good with that, because Frank wasn't a good guy either. So pretty much everyone who gets killed in this, probably except Lewis, were like, okay, that happened. As the youth of today would say, this one's a banger. I hate that term, but I just thought it was kind of funny if I use it. This film is, yeah. Uh, this is the type of film where you talk to your friend and you're like, are you into Giallo? And they're like, yes, I love. And then they just mainly talk about Argento, uh, maybe a little bit of Baba, maybe a little bit of Lenzi if they're real nerdy about it. And then you're just like, yes, but do you know about Mario Cayano? I in the Labyrinth. That's a must. So yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited to introduce a lot of people to this film, if you can't tell. There are so many zooms in this film, though. I do need to say that. There are so many films, so many zooms in this film that I thought, wait a minute, did I see the director correctly, or is this Umberto Lenzi? Umberto Lenzi in his film, so many zooms. This one, the same thing, so many zooms. I know it was a popular thing, but um, and a lot of, you know, a lot of directors, especially in Italy at that time, were doing that. But there are certain directors where it really stands out because they're such severe zooms or they're doing it so much. Lindsay obviously being one. And from this first film, maybe Mario Cayano does a bunch. I think the next movie I'm reviewing, ooh, let me see, is it also? No, it's not by him as well. But there will be at least one more film, I think, of his that I'm going to be doing at some point. So we'll see how the zooming is at that point. They really like using abandoned building, abandoned buildings in Giallo films in general. That's something that hit me during this because there are abandoned buildings used a few times in this film, and there have been abandoned buildings used in a bunch of other Giallo films. Um, uh, Watch Me When I Kill, I believe, had some abandoned buildings in it. Uh, this, um, a Lizard in a Woman's Skin by Fulci, that one did. Um, Torso by Sergio, I think it was Sergio Martino. Um, yeah, just a bunch of them have abandoned buildings featured. I think it looks good. I think it's cool, but just an observation. Uh, the one big thing I really hated about this film, in the areas where it's darker, the lighting was so bad that you literally couldn't see things. So, like, there were some indoor portions where it was supposed to be at night, and it was just very poorly lit, so you can't see much. There's some outdoor, a little bit in the dark, and you could see, like, nothing. So, that's the main, like, bad thing. But obviously, there are a lot of great things with this film. And I really enjoy it. So out of five stars with half stars in play, I'm going to give this a very solid four star rating. It has its flaws, but it's crazy. It's very entertaining. It's brutal. It's engaging. And I didn't see the end coming. And I love that. And uh, it's a good ending. Even when I see the ending coming, as long as it's well done and I think it was a good idea, I get excited about it. Uh, but it's that next level when I don't see it coming and it's a really good idea that I'm just like, oh, man. So yeah, so four stars for this one, but I would love to know your thoughts on this film. Put it down in the comments. Are you high on this film like me? Do you also think it's a banger? Or do you think it's not great? Or some, you know, mid a middling film? We can talk about that. Or if you just want to talk about Giallo in general. But uh, a reminder, check out my Giallo review playlist, because I have an entire playlist devoted to Giallo reviews on my channel. I also have entire play playlists devoted to directors such as Dario Argento, Mario Bava, Lucio Fulci, Sergio Martino, Umberto Lenzi. I think that's all of them. At, the, at least at the moment, that's all of them. So anyway, um, do me a quick favor. Hit subscribe if you can, which, you know, you can. It's quick. It's painless. It costs you $0, and it really helps me. It motivates me to keep doing these videos. So if nothing else, just do me a solid and keep me motivated. Help me out there. That's your way to repay me. 
Also hit the notification bell button if you want to know when I'm putting out my, uh, my next video. I'm usually putting out about four a week, sometimes more. Mm, hasn't been less, though. But regardless, I really thank you for taking your time to check this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.